Glory to Hanuman. Wakanda forever. We, we don't do that here. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another Rob Gets Real. Thanks for clicking this video. You know I appreciate it. This review will contain spoilers, so if you don't want to hear spoilers or major plot points, then bookmark this video and come back later. And if you don't care, continue watching. So Black Panther Wakanda Forever is a sequel to the highly successful 2018 Black Panther film which starred Chadwick Boseman. Wakanda Forever follows the events after Phase 4 where now Queen Ramonda, Shuri and the Dora Milaje fight to protect the nation from Namor and the Tullican army in the wake of King T'Challa's death. Ryan Coogler, who is the director of the movie, was left in a very tough situation with the unfortunate sudden death of the franchise's main character, the Black Panther himself, Chadwick Boseman. And I was curious as to how the filmmakers and the film studios are going to be approaching this difficult situation. I mean, it's a tough decision because do you recast the actor or, out of respect for Chadwick Boseman, not recast the character? And to my surprise, they picked the latter. They actually killed off King T'Challa's character, the Black Panther, in the Marvel Universe. Which, in my opinion, was a mistake. But hey, I see why they chose this route. I appreciated that the film does its best to pay its respect to Chadwick through a meaningful opening tribute. And I appreciated that they acknowledged his passing away from sickness and didn't make up some BS excuse that, you know, Black Panther succumbed to his injuries during an off-screen battle. The way they did it, it was important in reminding us that even the strongest heroes are fighting battles within, and sometimes they lose. I remember in my theater it was pitch silent when the Marvel logo was being presented with Chadwick's moments without any music. I felt the opening of the film was well handled considering the short turnaround time they had. What makes these Black Panther films so great, aside from the story and the action sequence, is the villains. The villains are actually well written and serve the story effectively. Namor is a villain which you can actually side with. He's taking a stand against the land in order to protect his people and the city from invaders. As an audience, we can see his point of view and even agree with it. Similar to Killmonger, these villains' ideologies aren't totally wrong and they believe the world will be a better place if their actions are actually carried out. The design of Namor on paper had me doubting how he would look with wings on his ankles. But after watching the movie, they totally work. His presence on screen was intimidating and I wanted to be on his side since it seemed that he genuinely cared for his people. I think Namor's biggest mistake he made was his overconfidence in his abilities by giving the Wakandan people one week to mourn. That is way too much time to give to such an advanced nation. I mean, for sure, they're going to find your weakness during that time and exploit it. He should have taken over when he had that chance. Now, some of the action sequences in this movie are pretty cool, while most of them relied heavily on CGI. But what really bothers me in these MCU movies is that they, they gotta bring in some form of Iron Man technology into these movies. Like, the Dora Milaje aren't good enough. Let's, uh, let's bring in Iron Man suits. Or Spider-Man himself isn't good enough. You know what he needs? Iron Man technology. I mean, come on, we're talking about Wakandan technology. It's so cool that they really couldn't come up with anything else other than ripping off the Iron Man suit again. Just let Tony die in peace. We all know he's going to be back eventually. So let the audience actually miss the Iron Man tech. Aside from that, the action was also well paced. For the most part, it seems that Marvel has found its formula for not trying to rush to the next big action sequences. When the action actually comes, we as an audience are invested in it, and it's just not visual noise on the screen. I also like how they incorporated old folk tales of the sirens in the water hypnotizing the enemies into committing suicide by jumping off the ships. And these Tullican warriors are fierce AF. They really give the Dora Milaje a hard time in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so that was a plus point for me. Even with the intriguing story, the movie still felt like it was missing the presence of the Black Panther, its lead character. It was missing T'Challa as the Black Panther. The side characters tried their best to fill that role, but at the end of the day, it's like asking Alfred to don the Batman suit rather than Bruce Wayne himself. The presence of the Black Panther in this movie was noticed and missed. So, let's get real. Following Chadwick Boseman's unexpected death due to colon cancer in 2020, 
one of the main themes of the film deals with grief and the inner battles one faces. The actress who plays Shuri really had to step into this role. And it's not something that she signed up for, but she gave it her best. And to me, the show stealer was Angela Bassett with her performance as the Queen of Wakanda, as she does one of her best monologues in order to maintain her nation's standing as an independent power. So overall, I'm giving Black Panther Wakanda Forever 3.5 stars out of 5. If you enjoyed this review, consider hitting that like and subscribe button down below. Until next time, peace.